So Nehemiah is a book in the Old Testament. We have Nehemiah, who is a guy who has a vision. He has a goal. He has a resolution. We're using those three terms interchangeably this series, even though those are three different things. There's nuances to them. And he hears that the wall that goes around Jerusalem is down. And this really bothers him because the nation of Israel has been defeated by Persia. They're in exile. Most of the people who are behind the walls of Jerusalem, most of the Jews, they're transported all over the Persian Empire as slaves or as grunt laborers. Nehemiah is at the top of the food chain. He is the cupbearer to the king. King Artaxerxes is the most powerful man in the world, really, at that, to- at that point, in the known world. And it's a high, high job, tasting wine, making sure the king doesn't get poisoned. He hears about the walls being down and he's crushed. Oh my goodness, what, what is wrong here? He realizes that it's not just a sign they've been conquered and they don't need their defenses any longer, but it's a sign of their national pride. And he has an emotional reaction. And in week one, we took a look at how we have to pay attention to our emotions. Don't make a resolution or goal unless you're feeling it. And if you're feeling something, recognize it might be God trying to talk to you. And he goes about the task of getting this done. Chuck talked last week about the planning process. All have to go through a planning process. And today we're going to talk about probably the most important thing to recenter us. And that is people. (laughs) People. What is the most important thing that God has ever created? I'll tell you it is. It's a person. It's you. It's the person next to you. God has created a lot of things. There's not even a close second to a human being. Human beings are the only thing that have been created in the image of God. We have feelings that animals don't have. They may have some feelings, but not to the degree we have. We have the ability to communicate. We have the ability to to uh, create. We have the ability to imagine things. We have the ability to cast vision. We have all kinds of things that God has. We have the ability to connect in unique and challenging ways. And so any goal, any vision, any resolution that is about you is going to come up wanting. Because if it's not about people, then God's not going to be all that involved in it. The most powerful things we do are things that we get stretched in, we get challenged in, and we can tie it to how other people will get blessed. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 to 18. Here is uh, what it says. Then I said to them, Nehemiah says this, you you see the, the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. Nehemiah tries to rally the troops and said, look at this. Look at this wall that's down here. Do you not notice? This this speaks poorly of us. This speaks poorly of our, our God. We're being derided. We're in derision. People are cracking on us. This is not well. We don't like this, do we? Nehemiah's trying to boost their self-esteem, call them to something that's higher than than their natural petty preoccupations. It isn't about, I've always wanted to build a wall. It's not about that. It's about how the people are, how they've been shamed, how the work of God has has been thwarted. Every vision God gives is about people. Every vision. In fact, even if it's a vision for the planet, to preserve the planet, it's for People, because people need the planet to be able to produce oxygen and and assimilate the proper carbon dioxide because people need to be taking care of the planet for people's sake and for God's sake. How much do you think about these things? When you think about the challenges you have in your life, the things you want to do, how often does the welfare of other people pop up? How many goals do you have or things that you would like to do the benefit other people or that other people are the driver. If you're normal, the answer to that would be none. If you're normal, average American, we bought into this lie of individualistic, rugged individualism. It's all about me, my goals, my actualization, my feelings. And we only think about other people in to the degree that we need other people to do what we want them to do. <laughs> But it's really not about them or blessing them. It's, it's really about us. Nehemiah has a shot at rebuilding this wall because he has, he has been able. Oh, okay. 
All right. Didn't know how that was going to go. He's been able to build trust and interdependence with people because he's a relational person. He loves people. King Artaxerxes gives him signed commendations for the king's forests and for resources and all that stuff because the king sees him emotionally distraught and he wants to help him. When we start to be about other people than ourselves, other people will want to help us. But if we're only fixated on ourselves, we're not going to get much help. As the nation of Israel goes about doing these things, here's three, here, four things that you and I need if we're going to actually do the things we want to do in 2024 or after that. The first, the first actually comes from Nehemiah 4.6. I'll just let the Bible speak for itself. Nehemiah 4.6, it says this. So we built the wall... And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. It doesn't matter how great the vision is, how great the goal is, how great the planning is. Unless somebody wants to work, it's not going to get done. Jesus said, my father, well, I, I, before I even tell you the verse, what do you think God's doing right now? Like right now, what do you think he's doing? You think he's binging a show? You think he's, <laughs> you know, you think he's making a list and checking it twice? What do you, what do you think he's doing right now? He's working. Yeah, according to Jesus, he's working. That's what he's doing. Jesus says, my father is always at work up in the present time, and I too am working. God is working. He worked to bring you here today. He's working to bring you into relationship with him. He's working on the pitfalls of your life that you don't even want him to work on. He's working on other things that are happening in this world. And he partners with us in ways that are very mysterious because he gives us free will and we mess up his work and he depends on us for his work. But he works. He works. And so when we come into relationship with God, work ethic is going to be a big, big deal. It's one of the reasons why if I'm going to hire a plumber or hire somebody like that, I, um, I won't hire them if I, know they're, if I know they're a Christian. Or specifically, I won't hire them if they put a Christian symbol on their business card. Because what they're trying to tell me is, I'm in the club. You should hire me. I don't care if you're in the club. I don't know if you have a mind to work. In my, all my years of construction, I knew believers that were in construction who did not have a mind to work, who took shortcuts. Not all of us, certainly not all of us, but some. And when someone advertises their faith, as their business and thinks it's going to give them a little nod. I'm like, eh, uh, normally it works the opposite way. Your work ethic should speak for itself. Our work is critical before God. God, when he puts human beings on the earth, he puts us here to work. Before any sin comes in the world, before any fruit is eaten that shouldn't eat, Adam and Eve were working. They were put here to take care of the planet, take care of the garden, name people, Work ethic, it's a big deal. You can't attract anyone that you aren't right now. So you can't attract workers to your life if you and I aren't a worker. And we'll see in a moment that, 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 uh, that Nehemiah is. The second thing that we see that happens with this project as it goes up, it's not just that these people come together and they've got a work ethic, but they also have the humility to actually follow. Uh, ours is a day where you know, people want to read about leadership, go to leadership conferences, leadership seminars. We want to be a leader. We tell our kids to be leaders. All that thing is fine and good. But, you know, if you want to write a book that no one's going to read, write a book on how to be a follower. <laughs> if you want to see a, a loser conference that no one would show up to, think about a conference on followership. No, like, no one wants that, right? Well, uh, no, everyone wants that. In fact, every great leader was first and is right now a great follower. Nehemiah got this plum assignment in his work ethic because he was a great follower of King Artaxerxes. He had an amazing work ethic and served him really, really well. Jesus Christ is a great follower. He says, I do nothing I don't see the Father doing. He's following the Father. The Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, points to and glorifies Jesus. You know, when I give a sermon on the Holy Spirit, when I give a sermon that, that the Holy Spirit is the X factor of God that fills you. If you come in relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit actually fills you. And there's an ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit that gives you an X factor of power. 
gives you peace that passes all understanding. It's, it's amazing. It's the greatest thing going. It's the greatest perk for being a follower of Jesus. The thing about the Holy Spirit when I talk about him is that he doesn't really like to be talked about. Because his job, according to the Bible, is to point and give all glory to Jesus. Because he's a follower of Jesus. Following is a, is a huge, huge thing. And if we don't have the humility to, humility to follow, then we will never have the strength to lead. No one will ever want to follow us anyway. In Nehemiah, we see different people, some who follow and some who don't. Let's take a look. These back-to-back verses. Here's some that do. Verse 4, chapter 3. And next to them, no, there's going to be a lot of names today that I'm not sure I'm going to get right. Okay, so just relax. You wouldn't do any better. Here we go. <laughs> and next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshulam, repaired. And next, next to them, Zadok, son of Bena, repaired. You get the sense that they're they're right beside each other, side by side by side. And there's all these names in here. I start counting up in chapter four alone. I counted, uh, I think it was 43 names in chapter four. There are all dozens upon dozens upon dozens of names of people who had a mind to work and are working along other side people, other people, and are following the vision of Nehemiah that comes from God. And we know their names because they're following, because they're pushing. This goes against our cultural predilection towards individualism. We're a very individualistic culture. We don't exalt following. We exalt rebelling. In fact, if you're a follower, you're a loser, you've checked your mind at the door, or you're a lemming or something like that. There's, there's all kinds of derogatory terms for that. And it, and it doesn't bode us well. And we have all kinds of things we say that are just not true. Well, if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. yourself. Right. Well, that may work if you want the bathroom painted. You could probably do it yourself. But what, when you start getting into things that are more complicated, you can't do it yourself. And if you've trained yourself to not be a follower and to not engender and endear trust from other people and to not love other people and not bless other people, if you've been operating that way, then you'll hit a wall because it's just a matter of time when you realize there's something you cannot do. It's not in you. You don't have the resources to do it. I'm not talking about financial resources. I mean emotional resources, mental resources. America, amazing country. No one founded our country. There were founders who founded our country. It wasn't a specific person. I've been over to Rome a couple times and you go to the Vatican, you got the Sistine Chapel, it's over there, maybe arguably, arguably the, one of the, not the greatest work of art, then certainly the greatest ceiling in the history of the world, the Sistine Chapel ceiling done by Michelangelo. And actually it was designed by Michelangelo and overseen by Michelangelo, but the majority of the brush strokes were not Michelangelo. He had a team. If he didn't do it, if he did it all himself, he never would have gotten it done in his lifetime. One is too small of a number for greatness. If you want to be great, if you want something in your life beyond where you are right now, you're going to have to learn to allow people to trust you and allow yourself to trust other people. Andrew Carnegie, who I think at one point was the richest man in the country, if not the world, he said this, no man will make a great leader who wants to do it all himself or to get the credit for doing it. Nehemiah brings all of these disparate people together, kings, soldiers, priests, princes, uh, princes, merchants, tradesmen, men, women. He brings them all together for this goal of actually putting the wall together properly and having the course lines be where they should be. It's still bothering me. I shouldn't be looking at this anymore. It's really, it's really freaking me out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't even look at it. It ticks me off. All right. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It really bothers me. Where was I? What was I talking about? <laughs> and God loves all the people who did this prop. He loves them. <laughs> he loves them and they did their best. It just wasn't good enough. But he loves them anyway. <laughs> we are all good. I trust you. We are all good. All right. Well, where was I? I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Uh, partying, partying. Uh, ah, I know. I got it. Was I got it? Was 
individualism, right? We talk about things like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's a fallacy. That original saying was tongue in cheek ridiculousness. And yet we use it that way. Your bootstraps are kind of like I have on these, these, these boots here, these little straps, right? Except your bootstraps would be on the side. So you pull your boots on. And then someone just made a stupid statement like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Equal force goes down as it comes up. And they meant it as a joke, like it was stupid. But we go, oh, yeah, go pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, you're stupid if you say that. <laughs> the whole point of the people who originated that saying was, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You need other people. We need other people. All of us need this. But we've got this myth of rugged individualism, which gives me the goal that I should be able to do it on my own and not lean into anybody else and not know anybody else. I think this is personally, uh, all of us who are in the healthcare industry, which I call myself in the spiritual healthcare industry, a lot of us are scratching our heads. People in my pastor industry, counselors, physicians, neuroscientists, everyone scratches their head like, what is going on with the runaway increasing rate of mental illness? It's uh, what, what, what is going on? My personal opinion, my personal opinion, is that we've never been more isolated and self-reliant than we are right now. And you'll get ill if you think you can do it on your own and you can be a rugged individualist and you can be a lone wolf and you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't, you won't, you're a ticking time bomb. I say that because I love you and because I believe I'm your pastor and God wants you to hear things like this. The way that normal America operates their life being about themselves and not people and not having a very close circle of people around them does not work. And the statistics and the consequences are self-evident. Doesn't work. Nehemiah gets his wall built because he's inside of a, inside of a national structure that is always known that it's about the whole. It's not about the individual. It's about the whole. First five books of the Bible, uh, Matthew, Mark, excuse me, that's New Testament. First five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books in the Old Testament, also known as the Pentateuch. Penta, five, tuk, law. Now, Torah is law. I'm not sure what tuk is. Pentateuch, those five books get picked apart a lot because there's a lot of laws in there. You can't understand those laws unless you understand those laws are in there to govern a people group so they get along well with one another. It's not that God is putting in hundreds of laws just because he wants to make things up for us to toe the line on. There's things in there like eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Jesus, when he says, you've heard it said eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. He's quoting the Pentateuch. And he's saying... You've heard this. We all know this. But I say to you, and what he's doing is he's not overturning that law. That law was meant for a just society to give out justice. If you lost your eye, it wasn't okay for the other person to kill you. No, it would be the judge might say, okay, well, we'll take out your eye too. If you maliciously took his eye out, we'll take yours out. Wasn't saying that was necessarily going to literally happen, but saying just wise for just society, there has to be appropriate response, not totally overreacting. And what Jesus was saying was, when he said, I say to you, he's saying, don't take the law into your own hands. You're not a judge. There's people who are, and that's not you. You're this individual vigilante who wants to make things right. Jesus said, no, no, that's not your role. Your role is turn the other cheeks. Turn the other cheek. Get over it. There's other people in society will hopefully make that right. Call the cops, do whatever you want, but stop thinking everything depends on you. It doesn't work this way. When, when Crossroads first started and, uh, you know, we just started growing like a weed, and, you know, like six months in the church, I'm not kidding around, six months, a year in, the Crossroads was already bigger than I ever thought a dream church would be. It was... Um, Really crazy. And we're like, we don't know what we're doing here. 
No one was deluded like, oh, I got this figured out, pulled myself by the book straps, by my bootstraps, and just uh, soul drawn, got this figured out. No, I, I knew and everybody else around knew, like, we are weighing over our heads. We know nothing. We are, we are dying here. This is not going well. So we brought in a consultant. And uh, I, I, this guy came in, and I actually called him, instead of a consultant, I, I said that he was my insultant. Because all he would do would, be, would insult me the whole time he came in. Why are you doing that? You got to do that. He's, 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 Great guy. I'm still close to him today. His name is Don Cousins. He's the father of Kirk Cousins, who is the NFL quarterback for the uh, Minnesota Vikings. So any intensity that Kirk gets, I never met Kirk. I know his dad. He gets it from his dad. Very, very intense, just intense guy. And um, Don, Don said this to me that's always rung true. He said, because we were always having problems with volunteers and staff and um, a lot of different types of problems. But they all basically boiled down to this. Don said this. He said, the toughest people to work with are those who are deluded about themselves. They think they can sing karaoke, but they can't. <laughs> and they can't laugh about it. They think they have the gift of teaching, but they don't. They think they're a leader, but they aren't. They think that they're funny, but they know. <laughs> Hardest people are people who are deluded about themselves. And the p folks who are deluded about themselves are almost always people who are isolated and don't have people around them who tell them the truth. Now, there's a humility that's necessary if we're going to ask somebody to tell us the truth. There's going to be a humility that we need if we're going to grow. So right after that verse where Nehemiah names all these people who are working side by side, look at the very next verse. It says, and next to them, the Tekoites repainted, repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. All of a sudden, the names stop. All of a sudden, people stop being memorialized because they don't have a mind to work. Here's what would happen. These nobles, they would, um, they had uh, land, perhaps. They had authority. They had servants. And People come to Nehemiah like, okay, hey, put me to work, coach. Put me in, put me in. What can I do? How can I, how can I do all this stuff? And the nobles, it said, would not stoop, or some translations say, would not show their neck. What does that mean? That means to stoop or to show your neck comes down like this. In some ancient customs, this was how you would lose your head. You expose your neck. Say, go ahead, I, I, I sacrifice, right? That's not what's happening here. By, by not exposing their neck, not stooping, what's being said is they're refusing to put a yoke on them to work. They're not being put to work. Jesus, Jesus says in the book of Matthew, I'm reading for you, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who, are, who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When you come to Christ, and when you start following Christ, there is a lot of difficult things that are before you. Jesus does not promise you an easy life. We need to reclaim a doctrine of difficulty. The closer you get to God, in many ways, the more difficult your life will get because the more important assignments he will give you that other weenie boys and weenie girls won't do. And if you want to walk close to them, You'll choose to pick up your cross and follow him, because that's what Jesus told us to do. Pick up my cross, being embrace difficulty. I'm gonna, at some point, I'm going to have a whole series on this. I've been pr pretty hot on this recently. But when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, my burden is easy, he's not saying, I'm not going to put anything on you. This is what old carpenters would do. You would stoop down your neck if you were an ox, and they would measure your, measure your neck, and they would make you a yoke that was custom fit for your neck, because if it wasn't custom fit for your neck, then you'd have pinch points and it would be very, very uncomfortable. But if you have a yoke that's cut for your neck and can equally bear weight, you can bear a lot of weight and be comfortable. That's what Jesus is saying. Take my yoke, my yoke, the one that's designed for you. Do things that I want you to do, not necessarily things that everybody else wants you to do. And the nobles, they refuse to, to stoop their neck down because they were saying, no, you're not putting a yoke on me. No, no, I'm not working. And they didn't. And we don't know their names. Because they weren't humble enough to be immortalized like all the other names that I can't pronounce. <laughs> no work, no name. 
When you don't work, you don't get a name. When you don't roll up your sleeves and go after things, you're not remembered. When you do and you're thinking of people, people grieve you. They want you. They need you because you added value. Three, communal connection. Communal connection. There is communal connection with everybody here. They're all doing their thing. They're all hanging out with each other. Uh, Nehemiah 3, 23, 24. After them, Benjamin, the Hasbub, repaired opposite their house. And after them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his house. And it just keeps going, naming more names. And they repair beside their house. Nehemiah is not dumb. He says, oh, I'm a leader. I'm going to help you have skin in the game. This means you're going to build the part of the wall that's outside your house because you're going to want that part of the wall to be strong. And they also had all the, all the rubble and all the rocks that were there to rebuild the wall. And they're doing this side by side by side. Again, communal connection. When I say something like, you know, Jesus loves you and he died for you. I'm half right when I say that. He does love you. And if you receive him, you do get the benefits of his death so that you don't have to die eternally. He's died for you. But understand that the Bible says that he died for a community. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. World. The wall being built is for the community of Israel. It's not for Nehemiah to have his personal thing. In fact, I think right now, I think Nehemiah is really bummed in heaven that there's a book in the Bible named after him. He didn't want a book in the Bible named after him. People who have a heart to work and have a, who are followers and have a heart for community, we don't, we don't want our, our, our pictures up on a wall. You're never going to see my picture on a, in a frame on a wall here at Crossroads. So it's, it's not about me. And the closer you get to God, the more you recognize that. It's not about you. You, you, want, you want to give the glory to other people because it's about people. You want to give the glory to God. And when you do that, there's no limit virtually to what can get done. In doing so, we create value. Last point here. We create surplus value. Nehemiah 5.15 puts it this way. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Yet for all this... I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Now, I'm going to sound to some of you right now, I'm going to sound to some of you like a flaming liberal right now. Okay? So relax. Relax. But I'm going to say some things that you're going to be like, wait a minute, that... Uh, uh, hmm. The Bible knows very little of rugged individualism. It doesn't. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. It says things in the book of Galatians like everyone should bear his load. So you can't be dependent and assuming the government or somebody else is going to do for you what you can do yourself. You, gotta, you have to have a work ethic. You got to do these things, right? And at the same time, the Bible establishes again and again and again and again and again and again that God deals with communities. He deals with people. He deals with nations. People specifically plural. And God is not happy, and Nehemiah is not happy, that we have some of the nobles, some of the governors here, who are using their authority, using their wealth to abuse other people. They would lend at interest rates that were extreme, or perhaps even worse, they would take collateral for a loan, known as usury, and they would have somebody give something that they needed, like a, a, a winter coat, when maybe they needed a coat in the winter. Better to take the family jewels in the winter coat. Well, one kind of family jewels. Better take that than, than a coat or take a millstone from somebody for collateral when they're not, now they can't ground flour. And Nehemiah says, you guys, you're, you're, you're abusing other people. And we have this happening in America. We have the ever-widening income gap. It's getting wider and wider and wider and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be people who make a lot more money than others, but I am saying people up here should be really concerned about people down here. Should be. That's what Nehemiah was. Nehemiah 
forwent certain perks that came his way. And he said, look, I, I, deserve, a, I deserve, deserve the salary, but by the blessing of God, I'm good. I'm not going to take the salary. In fact, I'm going to bring people in. I'm going to feed them at my own table. He was creating surplus value. That's what he did with his life. He wasn't just trying to have a goal for him to check off and say, I'm a type A driven person. I did what I want to do this, 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 this year. He was creating surplus value. Stuff beyond him that was, that was a blessing to other people. He was giving up his rights. MLK weekend was last weekend. I spoke with a friend of mine, Damon Lynch Sr., who marched with Martin Luther King years ago. He said to me, he said, you know, Martin died for my rights, but Jesus died for my wrongs. It was deep. It was deep. And it was good what Martin Luther King did. Good to have rights for, for people who are in America. And as a believer, one of the things we do is we don't, we, we let go of our rights as a believer. I'm not talking about your rights as American necessarily, but I mean just rights, things you have to have coming to you, things that you, you fight for. Jesus gave up his rights when he left heaven. Gave it up. Jesus gave his rights when he went to a cross. And humble leaders who want to add surplus value will not cling to what they could keep in order to bless other people and create surplus value. We're trying to do that here in our church for all kinds of people, including younger people. We've got a really, really strong group of younger people. It's called 18 to 24. It's actually called 1824, not to be confused with a Yellowstone spinoff. Though I will say, if you're not a Yellowstone fan, 1923, the greatest love story I've ever seen. You're welcome. Nonetheless, in 1824, we're trying to stay young as a church, trying to push things out there, trying to do the right things. And so we're re constantly retooling. And I love what's happening at the George, formerly known as Crossroads Uptown, formerly known from that as Old St. George. We've got hundreds of leaders, kids, students, 18 to 24, that are meeting, they're getting built into, they're learning various things, they're worshiping together. It's great. And what's great about it is we as a church have to keep working to stay young, to lean towards the next generation. Jesus was over 19. Peter was 19 and over. All the rest of the disciples were under 18. How do we know that? Because there was a miracle of Jesus retaining a fish, a, a, a coin out of a fish, and it was to pay the temple tax. And he has that to pay for him and Peter because everybody else is younger. We as a church have to work to be younger, and we're going to work to be younger. Uh, before I finish off and close the prayer, I want to tell you something that's really cool and important happening around here. Uh, I've been doing the same job. I've been doing the same job for... Uh, 28 years. I was senior pastor when I first came to Crossroads, and I'm still senior pastor. I was senior pastor when I was the only person on staff, <laughs> and uh, just because I thought it sounded kind of like a cool, sexy title. And I'm still senior pastor, and I'm still pretty much doing the exact same things I've been doing for 28 years. Responsible makes for the weekends going okay, creative ideas, managing this department, that department, just on and on and on. It's all good. It's all, all really important. I believe, I believe that there's another gear that God wants me to hit. I believe there's been things that I've been doing for 28 years that uh, I need to be letting go. By the way, I'm not leaving Crossroads. I'm sorry. I know that bums you out. You're going, good, he's leaving. No, I'm not leaving Crossroads. <laughs> I'm still senior pastor. <laughs> but I'm realizing there's a, oh, uh, you don't have to be that. You don't have to be honest. But we have, um, we need to get some younger people who are bearing some significant weight around here to enable me as well to have some creative breakthroughs that I think God may want us want to do through our community. What happens if God uses us to bring an awakening to our country? What happens if there's stuff that's underneath the surface that we need to mine that um, we don't have the capacity to? I, I would like to have some capacity to get us to another level, but I can't do it by doing the same things I've been doing for 28 years. So uh, we're opening up a new position. We have a new position. The new position is called lead pastor. That lead past position is responsible for all the bread and butter things that makes Crossroads Crossroads on a day-in, day-out basis. And I'm excited for you to meet him. Our lead pastor's name is Kyle Ranson. Welcome to the stage. Come on, Kyle. Look at that, Kyle. Aww. They like you. Hey, so they like nice you. Yeah, 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 I like you. I like you, too. Yeah. I yeah. like you, too. Yeah. How are you yeah. feeling about this? Uh, awesome, amazing. I'm I better humbled, sit, excited, so I better, honored. I better yeah, sit, you're just, yeah. It just, maybe I could stand on the wall. Maybe that'll bounce, <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm super pumped. I'm, I'm incredibly pumped, honored, humbled, excited. Sarah and the kids are too. Um, I, I want to say something really clearly that's most important to me about this shift. 
If you want to know what I'll be doing as lead pastor, I will be following him. That's what I'll be doing. There, there's a clear chain in the Bible of authority, and I want to make sure that that stays here. As this, as this change happens, I hope you heard Brian. He is not evacuating. He's elevating so that he can see more of what God has for us. And um, I've had the pleasure and the honor of having him as my pastor since I was 19 years old. I, I've been on this staff with him as my top boss for 18 and a half years, and I get to see something that you don't get to see, which is what happens when the lights go off and all of you leave, and the parking lot empties, and he walks off the stage. Do you know what happens with him? Do you know what's different? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. He's faithful, and he's true, and he's worth following, and I, I just, I just want to celebrate you in, in doing this. This is not a move that people do. Okay, but we're here to I'm celebrate so thankful. you, not celebrate I know. me. I, I, I thank That's you. not what I wanted to do. Too bad. <laughs> I got the microphone. <laughs> this is your point. You made me lead, pastor. <laughs> okay, you're leading. Okay, okay. go ahead, lead. Uh, and lead. second thing is this, second thing, and then I'm almost done. Um, I just believe in what God's doing in this church. I, I just do. I, I love this church, believe in this church. Uh, I could go somewhere else and be a senior pastor. I have zero interest in that. I I'm here for what God's doing, not just in this generation, not just in the next one, but I believe in generation after generation after generation. I believe we're a movement that God intends to change the world. So I'm all in. There we go. Right. Kyle is uh, one of those rare people who has a capital L leadership gift and a capital T leadership gift. He's obviously very younger than me. And he bears stress really well. It's a very stressful job. I appreciate you praying. By the way, I never knew how many people prayed for me now that they're praying for me in the app. I'm getting pelted. I turn off my notifications. So all I'm doing is seeing someone. It's, it's really yeah. awesome. It's amazing. I just have to do other things and look at your name after you prayed for me. It, it means a lot to me. But you need to be hopefully adding or directing some of those prayers to this guy. So he's going to have a lot of weight in his shoulders. He has a lot of weight in his shoulders, and he, he can bear it. Let me pray for you right now, okay? God, thank you for Kyle, this uh, godly man of yours who's been so faithful and so good and so fun to be doing life with. I ask that more people would get to taste the fruit of his labor. I ask you'd fill him with creativity in his mind beyond what he already has. I pray you give him divine insights to see things that others can't see, to feel things that others can't feel. I thank you for how you bless his family and Sarah and his kids. I ask you to pour special grace on them. And we look forward to our best days ahead as a community with him as lead pastor. Mm -hmm. And we all, God's people, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we'll talk about conflict and difficulty and pain. That's what Nehemiah has to deal with. And all of us will deal with this. The thing that makes us palatable is if we take on the attitude of humility that we've seen today, and if we allow ourselves to become expendable, to be spent, to pick up our cross. The most expendable people are the most irreplaceable people because they have a spiritual power and a perspective that other self-sufficient pull myself up on my bootstrap kind of folks don't get and understand. But this is the model of Nehemiah, and it's the model of Jesus. And I hope you're getting it because the world needs you to get it, needs all of us to get it, and a great future, not just for you, but for all the people around you should be in store because of it.